Welcome to the Vault Studios NFL Podcast, an Australian twist on all things NFL. The boys are cracking into a nice cold beer from Burnley Brewing. Let's join them. Let's join them. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the show. I'm your host, J.A., and I am joined by my Bucks-loving, Richmond-loving, everything-loving friend, uh, Garraway. How are you, mate? Excellent, buddy. How are you? Good. My intros, they're pretty good. I, I can I can lay an intro down. <laughs> Just do it straight off straight off the cuff too. No prepping in this podcast. You know what? Podcast prepping's for people who have successful podcasts. <laughs> Should people get paid to do it? <laughs> yeah, it's not us. We don't have all day to prep. Um, what we do have is tonight, Richie. You know, that's a terrific segue. What we do have tonight is Robert Mays from the Athletic. Formerly Very exciting. The, and, and the Ringer. I haven't announced it. We interviewed him over the weekend. Stayed up till 2 a.m. to uh, interview him, and I can promise you it was all worth it in the end. Um, he was awesome. So it was me and Corey. People should know Corey from the Fantasy Football Show. Um, we interviewed him together. It was great. It was terrific. So he's coming up soon. Um, what I wanted to do is just a quick little, you know, some of the stuff we talked about, I tried to keep it not time relevant, like try not to talk about guys who hadn't been signed and stuff like that yet because I knew they'd probably been signed by now. For example, Kenny Golladay was one we talked about. So, um, yeah, we tried to keep it a bit time desensitive, I should say. So, yeah, it, it's a great interview, a bit of insight into him and how he got to where he is. And um, I was saying to you before, it was just so bizarre to hear his voice and see it coming out of his mouth after listening to him for so many years. It was it was, it was really interesting. It, it always is when you interview someone who's, you know, you listen to so often. So very cool interview. Want to thank our friends from Burnley Brewing. Um, your support is undying, I should say. It's a great word. We also did our Patreon break, Richie, the other day. And believe it or not, the person who came first in the Patreon picked the box of beer over the sign, Chase Winovich Helmet. Really? So, yeah, he said, it, and it was our great friend Regan up in uh, up in Queensland. He said, Miami's own. He said, "Have you got any of those uh, co- coffee beers?" So oh, I got a coffee four? brown. I can I, I can throw I can throw a four pack in. I can't spare them. They're they're very coveted down here. I can't spare them, but I can throw four in, and I can do a little mixture. So, sending one up to him, and also uh, Lewis from uh, from the Rangers won the the mini helmet, and he's actually a big collector. So it turned out perfect because he doesn't drink, and he messaged me when he saw that he came second, saying, "Hey, um, keep the beer because I don't drink. It's, it'd be a waste. Give it to someone else. Use it. Give the next person two boxes or something like that." And I said, "Well, it turns out that the first prize wants." the uh, beer, so you get the helmet, and he's actually a massive collector of signed helmets. So it really worked out this month, and if you want to get involved for next month, you're going after this signed Mark Andrews Ravens mini helmet. It's a really cool little helmet. Ravens is a a classic look for a classic team, and also the box of Burnleys, and you've got the, um, I'll move it over, the stubby holder, which I'll make sure I put in there for you as well. So a couple of awesome prizes, 10 bucks a month. It's nothing. Get in there, sign up, and thanks to Burnley Brewing for being a terrific sponsor, and thanks to All Sports Memorabilia for um, helping us get this uh, th- these mini helmets for the first few months. So they've been great. But Richie, we haven't got time for this. We've got to get through this and get to Robert Mays. Let's start with Kenny Golladay and Adoree Jackson. We talked about them both last week. Both signed with the Giants. Golladay was a four-year, I want to say forty-five million dollar deal, off the top of my head, and um, Adoree Jackson was four years, thirty-nine million, I believe. So. Two guys that we, you know, we thought would get good deals ended up getting, you know, pretty good deals. Yeah, and look, it's good. I mean, they're overpaid, but <laughs> it's free agency. You have to. It's just how it works. So yeah. I don't necessarily mind that. What I do like is you know, they're trying to bring more talent into the building. The Giants yeah. haven't got enough of it. They've got to bring it in. They've put them on four-year deals, which really are two-year deals. That's when the guaranteed money will run out. Um, and they're bringing more talent into the building, which they need a ton of it. So um, I certainly um, don't dislike these. Um, as I was looking back through the list, the best free agent signings, they were almost all a team who just signed one or two free agents to fill needs or teams that re-signed their own guys. So, you know, with those things sort of in mind, yeah, the these kind of deals are, um, I think, are good for a team like the Giants. I hate the, um, let's call it the 
uh, Houston Texans approach where you just try and sign everybody um, to these stinky one-year deals. Um, I don't like that way. But I think what the Giants have done here is is good for them. And yep. these two guys are going to be day one starters probably for the both, I reckon, see at least two years and maybe even a third and fourth into these deals. Yeah, I'd say so for sure. I, I really like Adore Jackson. I know he had some difficulty at times at the Titans, but he's a quality player. He's a first-round pick just coming off his rookie deal. Um, and I really like Kenny Golladay. I think Kenny Golladay has the potential to be one of the, you know, certainly a top 10 receiver if, if the right situation. I just don't know if the Giants are the right situation, and I just don't know if Daniel Jones is the right quarterback to get that done. But he did improve down the stretch last year. We've got to give him time. Um, I know we had a bit of a joke about it last week that the Giants were ready, weren't ready to move on from him after two years, even though they fire all their coaches after two years. But, you know, at least they're giving him some weapons. We're, we're going to know this season um, how good, I guess Kenny Golladay and Daniel Jones are when we see them together because there's some speculation that Golladay is a bit overrated as well. So we'll find out. It'll be very interesting. I want hopefully to there's a running. Sorry, just before we move on. Hopefully, there's yeah. a running back there this year, right. which will help both. Which will help both of them. Help all of them, I think. Yeah. <laughs> all of them. Uh, maybe they land another offensive lineman in the draft. It, they said the East for me is kind of wide open. I know the Cowboys are, you know, talent-wise, the best team, but they're also very poorly coached in my opinion and I'm having got as a fan I haven't got any confidence in that they're going to be you know they're going to win the division I think it's anyone's division to be honest but the Eagles and the Eagles will struggle but certainly the favorite at the moment is Washington and the Giants aren't that far behind they've made some good moves a couple of things go their way they're right in the mix it's the best so, defense in the division without question yes Washington for sure yeah uh, let's move on to the Chicago Bears and we talked about this as Robert Mays because he's a Chicago Bears tragic it was good fun actually having a conversation with him but Kyle Fuller was cut by the Bears to save 11 million dollars which they then used um, 10 million of that to sign Andy Dalton so well done Chicago uh, great move I know who I'd prefer on my team he quickly first visit Broncos re-signs who's the head coach of the Broncos Richie no idea Vic Fungio, who was the defensive coordinator for the Bears when Kyle Fuller had his best season. He's been very good the last couple of years. But when he had his breakout year, it was under Vic Fangio. He goes straight back to Denver. Denver quietly have made some very good moves. If they can get the quarterback position sorted out somewhat, they I think they're going to be a very strong defense. So I am I'm, I'm, I love this move. I think Kyle Fuller's got a lot left to the tank. He's a great football player. It's just a solid starter, it's top corner you can just insert into your team and he's going to just take the best guy every week and play really well. It's a reliable, solid starter, above average starter, you would say. Certainly agree, but they've still got a big issue they've got to sort out. Quarterback, which I said, we'll have to see what they do in the draft, whatnot, um, whether they roll with lock, lock again. That they have. They're, they're in the situation that the Browns were in not that long ago where you got to draft one every single year because you got, you got to hit on one. As yeah. you said, that's a pretty good defense in an extremely competitive division where the quarterback situation is solved at every other team in your division except for you guys. And got to yeah. get it fixed. Agreed. Agreed. Interesting enough, we'll talk about the division just on, off topic. The Raiders cut Marcus Mariota, who a lot of people were saying Mariota was going to take over from Carr. I'm starting to get the picture that Gruden's pretty high on Carr, even though he's he making is. a bunch of moves from the court, from the O line and stuff like that. I think he he must like Derek Carr because that'd be the easiest person for them to move on to save cap would be Derek Carr, and they're not. So he must like him. And said we're big fans of Derek Carr. We we have been for a long time. So um, it'll be interesting to see how that pans out over there. Um, but yeah, that division it's a it's a tough division in there. Tough, tough division of football, especially um, when you're the. Especially when you're the team without a quarterback. Yes, agreed. Uh, let's move on. Just a quick one. Isaiah Wilson, who we talked about a couple of weeks ago um, with the uh, Tennessee Titans. Titans. He was the first first round pick last year for the Tennessee Titans. Um, he's been moved on. He was, he was traded to the Dolphins because of massive off-field issues or field issues, wouldn't turn up to meetings, all that sort of stuff. Um, the first week, he rocks up late to a team meeting, doesn't attend voluntary camps, which he was told he had to attend, and was cut by the Dolphins. So I would, I think probably one more team will take will take a chance on him. I think he need, he'll probably need three strikes in the NFL because of his talent. But this guy, this is a guy who, you know, at 22 years old, he's seeing his future very, very quickly get away from him. And it's you know, as someone who has never, who will never have the opportunity to have that future. It kind of pisses me off to see someone pissing it away like this for no fault of anyone else but their own. Um, and I just 
one day he's going to wake up maybe 20 years, maybe 30 years from now, maybe five years from now and go, shit, it's in the NFL. Like, I was there. Um, it's bizarre to me. Hopefully he doesn't have some some serious issues and he can try and get himself right. But, you know, strike two for Isaiah Wilson. And, you know, we know about the NFL. They just, after a while, teams will just stop caring. He certainly had some strange uh, Instagram videos come out after he was cut. I think the Dolphins might have known they were coming. Um, plus he also yeah, claims he went a whole bunch of drugs. I don't know whether they're prescribed or recreational or what. Like, I, I don't know. This is a guy with issues. If I can run people through, a lot of people don't will not know who this is because he's barely taken a snap, even though he was a first-round pick. But mm. I'll run you through a timeline. This won't take long. Yeah. So in December 2019, he said he's going to skip his senior year at Georgia and declare for the draft. At the draft, he was selected by the Titans, 29th overall in the first round, six foot six, 350 pounder, ready to compete for a starting right tackle job. Mm-hmm. Camp opens, he immediately goes on the COVID-19 reserve list. Um, he was also the only member of the Titans draft class who hadn't signed um, a contract. and He was unavailable due to issues related to coronavirus. He didn't actually have it. Fast forward to August, he's removed from the COVID list, signs a four-year deal, uh, and is eligible to return to practice. Later in August, Tennessee State Police, uh, University Police, issue him with a trespassing warning. Apparently, he was breaking up an on-campus party fight, something. What the hell were you even doing there? Um, September, he was placed on the COVID-19 list again, um, opening up a spot on the roster. Come September 11th, he was then arrested and charged for driving under the influence. He was then, after being on the COVID-19 list for more than a month, like, I don't think he had COVID, I just were cheating and oh, using, that, using yeah. that list. He was activated and allowed to practice with the team. Um, a touch over a month later, he made his NFL debut in a game against Indianapolis. He played three snaps and special teams. December 5th, he was suspended from the upcoming game against Cleveland for violating team rules. December 9th, he's placed on the non-injury football list. The statement said he is dealing with some personal issues. Fast forward into Feb, for whatever reason, they couldn't work it out. He is traded. Uh, Sorry, no, he then says, I'm done with football as a Titan. He is then traded. Come March, he agrees to a trade with the Dolphins. Subsequently, a handful of days later, he is cut. So he's a winner. That's an incredible 12 months. Absolutely incredible 12 months. He, known, I I was going to use the word normal. I kind of don't want to use that word, but I think I still will. A normal person just doesn't do this. This doesn't happen to. A healthy person. I think that's a better word. Yeah. There's something going on there. Um, There is piles and piles of issues going in with his life i don't know um if they're drug caused or drug um related or alcohol related um or it's just mental health or whatever it is this guy needs help i actually hope that the nfl players association actually fucking do something for a change and get out and try and help this guy because he's not going to be on an nfl roster they're not going to help him and quite frankly, it's their job to. Yeah. And maybe he gets that third chance, as you said, but he has to sort his life out before anyone else signs him because if someone signs him now, I guarantee you he's going to fuck it up again because of all the things that are going on in his life and he stands no chance to win. The NFL PA should do their job, get involved in this guy's life, try and help him out. I'm not saying they have to save him, but they have to try. Yeah. to do something. If he doesn't want it, well, then so be it. But they got to try and help him. So if he does get a third chance, he's got some some hope of actually pulling it off. Because if you're going back and watch his tape, he was taken in the first round for a reason. He's a v- very good football player, very talented. And then there's also talks, you know, some people have said maybe he doesn't like football. Maybe, maybe. he doesn't. So, so that doesn't mean you just turn your back on him. He said the NFLPA have got to try and help because there's some serious issues here. If this was a normal workforce, like if he was having these issues in a normal job, you know, it's not professional sport, it would be a completely different issue. He'd be in with HR. We don't know what's happened at this point, but the NFL is very cutthroat. If you can't deliver on what you need to, you just cut. Simple as that. 
and they'll move on to the next guy. So you're right. Hopefully he can get some help because you said Definitely. we're big advocates of having as many talented football players in the league as possible and having a first round pick not be in the league after not even 12 months after being drafted is just insane to me. It's yeah. just insane. And it's not like he's a bust. We don't even know if he's any good or not. Um, he's had three every, snaps. Even Jamarcus Russell lasted three seasons before he was <laughs> never seen again. Like, you know what I mean? He loved it's, that uh, purple drink, though. He did. He definitely did. Uh, let's move on to a bit of a bit of a bad situation for Deshaun Watson, who's wanting to be traded. Uh, he has been doing some naughty, uh, alleged naughty, naughty things. There's a civil action against him. Funnily enough, the lawyer who's involved in this, Richie, is neighbours with the owner of the team, believe it or not. So I don't know how much that plays into it or it's just a bit of a coincidence, but um, it's a big coincidence if you ask me, but he's in a bit of trouble um, and it's hard to sugarcoat this. He's uh, I'll just give you, read you a quick, quick blurb. Houston lawyer Tony Busby, who is representing all 13 of the women who have filed suits against Watson, told reporters Friday that he's ant- anticipating... 12 total suits against Watson. Busby also said he has spoken to 10 other women about Watson's conduct. Um, The conduct is stuff to do, all different. It's probably worth having a read if you care. It's not very pretty, any of it. A lot of pictures, um, sexual assault during a massage with a massage therapist. He allegedly grabbed her butt and genitals during a massage. Um, all along those lines. That's only one of them, but they're all very similar, you know, unsolicited pictures, unsolicited pictures. Is that the right word? Yeah. Um, just, it's a bad look. It's a terrible look for him. Um, now, if it was one or if it was one, you'd be like, oh, maybe it's a bit of, you know, one of those just trying to grab some media attention, but 12, 13 now, that's, you know, when there's that many, it starts to become... You, know, you start to have to think, okay, this has obviously happened. Something, something's yeah. happened anyway. <clears throat> yeah, and they were all raised um, by the same lawyer. They're all being filed in, in Texas where all these suits are public. So mm-hmm. if you want, just go click on it. I literally have one of them up right now. Mm-hmm. So these aren't hard to find if I go have a look. Now, as far as, um, oh, look, all unwanted advances are unwanted advances. Um, but I think we could all agree that there's levels, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, I know. Some of, and some of this is, is um, it's a bad look. It's, it's an ugly look. Um, but there's nothing particularly heinous here. These aren't, I don't think you could ever get a conviction in a criminal court for the actions that are described in these. But that being said, this is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Like this could end up as a lot of lawsuits and this is hard to just make it go away. I don't think he's going to be able to. So he's got plenty of time to work on his defense because he's he's not going to be playing football. Um, I doubt, I still doubt they're going to trade him. So this is a real ugly mess for him and, and a real ugly side of, of football. Um, and I mean, I, I tend to just believe women these days because all this shit usually turns out to be true. It's so, not. Who was the guy that was it? Reuben Foster, who we buried for, and then Kate and the woman came out a, a week later and was like, yeah, I lied. Um, but you said that's, that's the exception. Know, yeah, that, it's, it's certainly not the rule. There's so yeah. much that goes on. You look at even. Look at Jared Hayne during the week. Was found guilty of a sexual assault in Australia. You think those two things that happened in America that they settled civilly out of court? Mm-hmm. You don't think those happened? Like, of course they happened. Like, yeah. he's clearly, and I don't sugarcoat or, or even think twice what he's using. He's clearly a sexual predator. Like, yeah. that's just what he does. Just um, on a side note, like Jared Hayne, right? I can't imagine a guy like, and the same with Deshaun Watson. I can't imagine they have any problem getting girls. You know what I mean? Like, I can't imagine that's an issue for them. Is it a bit of a sickness to have to be like that? In my opinion, like if you can basically like they could have most girls they want. You would imagine. It's, like they're, it's, they're it's the way they treat them, though. Yeah, that's what I mean. So it's, it's, yeah, you it's, probably can, but you can't have everybody, and they think they can have everybody, and that's and the then, problem. And then when they can't, it's hey, oh, they, and they force it exactly. You're going to end up saying, yeah, it's. 
it's a terrible look. It's a terrible, you know, it's role disgusting. model on, 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 me, on, you know, young men and stuff like that and, you know, teammates around him and, yeah, I said, I've, I've never been around that sort of stuff. I don't know. It's it's, a, it's just, yeah, it's pretty shit and I hope this isn't true. I really do for Deshaun Watson's case but he's going to have a suspension although, you know, Jameis Winston got suspended when he had that incident with the, the lady in the taxi um, in the Uber or whatever it was. Like, he... <laughs> He's going to face some sort of penalty for this. Um, and you know what? All it does is just dampen his trade value for him. It's less yeah. team, teams are going to be less and less likely to trade for him now. And he's going to, he's either going to have to play for Houston this year or sit on the bench. Or like, hopefully this doesn't become criminal and he doesn't get in serious trouble. Well, you can't say hopefully because if it happened, I hope it does become criminal. But sorry, yeah, if it's true, yeah, if, hope, yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, more I'm for hoping, his sake. Hoping it's not true, but I think what will normally happen, and this is what normally does happen in this case, is there'll be some sort of out of court settlement before it becomes a criminal act, um, and basically they'll, th- they'll throw some money at it to stop it. Um, well, you know gonna what? Have it, to, it's going to have to play if he wants that money. That's what I mean. It's it's going to put some pressure because I tell you what, I bet you Houston aren't knocking on the door saying, "Yeah, we'll we'll help you out here." What do you need? You need some support. He's, yeah, it's a terrible timing, and you know I hope it's not true. Um, but it's hard to argue when you see this many women come out. It's you know if it's one, I'm kind of like, oh, okay, we'll wait and see. If it's two, I'm like, oh, all right, maybe you know maybe they're in it together. If when it gets to three or four or five, you're like, come on, like this can't be coincidence they can't all be talking to each other going we're going to screw this guy's life over it's yeah, which it does awesome. happen but it's not not to this degree so interesting we'll have to keep keep a bit of an eye on that it's it's the uglier side of of sport and, and male athletes and if you are an athlete if you are a person like that there's no means no as me and richie we're both fathers of daughters mate and um over the years my perspective's changed on all this sort of stuff it's just i think have, have some fucking respect simple as that the, you said the ugly side of sport Ugly side of just men. I was going to say, if you just look at politics at the moment and all the sort of thing, it's just, yeah. I think men as a general rule, and I've said some heinous stuff over the year. I'm not going to try and act like I'm some superior moralist, mm. but we all have to do a better job. I, quite frankly, everybody does. Yeah, just really think about how you're behaving <laughs> all the time. That's the only message yeah. I'm going to say. Just, Think about if, if, if think about um, my thing. I do now is I think if someone said this to my daughter, how would I feel about that? That's how I kind of do things now, and it, it changes your perspective on things. I, I promise you that. Sure does. Uh, let's move on. Uh, that's it for me and you tonight, Rich. We got Robert Mays coming up. I said I just it was so good to talk to him. Got some O line talk in there, Richie. Um, had a bit of a joke about how he uh, needs to come on and just do an O-line chat with me and to block out, you know, eight or nine hours in his in his calendar to come on <laughs> and walk O-line with me, which he had a little laugh about and then said, yeah, I'll block it out. But I think he was being sarcastic. I'm not sure. I don't think he's really going to block out a full day for me. Um, but, you know, I'll believe it. He also said a, he also said one of my points was very interesting. So um, I'll die happy. Simple as that. That's it. <laughs> Life achieved. Achievement moment. <laughs> no, with all seriousness, though, Enjoy having a listen to him. Um, I'll jump on quickly after the interview and just do a quick wrap up, but um, enjoy listening to him. Thanks to Corey for lining it up and getting it sorted. Thanks to Robert for coming on, and I hope everyone enjoys it. Richie, I know you're going to have a listen tomorrow. Thank you for coming on for a, a quick one tonight or a, a quickie, as I like My to call pleasure. it. Always for <laughs> you, mate. Always good having a quickie with you. Um, but yeah, well, um, you'll see us both next week, and enjoy Robert Mays. Thanks, Rich. And while the writing side, I wouldn't say has diminished, but it the overall proportions of how I spend my time and energy and focus, I would say, has changed over the past 10 years for sure. Okay. And was it cool? Obviously, I guess the big what's Bill Simmons like to work for? <laughs> <laughs> uh, show. Bill is a lot like you'd think Bill is like. I mean, it, yeah. yes, it was very cool. I mean, uh, I was just talk, talking to him earlier, like a couple weeks ago, we were just going back and forth and it's been 10 years you know Grantland I moved out there almost 10 years ago to the week to go work there and it's it's almost impossible to believe that that's true but looking back at that time I mean every time I would interact with him it would be just ridiculous I'd be like I can't believe this is happening but eventually it just becomes normal (laughs) and 
Uh, he's he's a lot like you think he is, and I've said this before. I mean, watching him work and just the way his mind works it was amazing back then. You just you saw all the different ideas that he could spit out, and just how much he would engage with whatever he was watching. And we would go sit. Remember, our offices at ESPN were on the second floor of like the ESPN LA offices. We shared the office with them, and there was a conference room at the end of the hallway. And especially early on in the Grantland days, we would just go sit in there. And you know, Bill would just put his feet up on the desk and we'd, we'd sit in there for hours and just kind of come up with different things we wanted to do and ideas we had for the site. And, and that's how we spent a lot of time, especially in those early days before we launched and as we were getting started. And it's just weird to think about that now. But when I was around him, it became very apparent as to why he'd been so successful, that it had not been an accident because his mind was just constantly going with new stuff. It was very cool to watch and very cool to be close to. Yeah. Um, a follow up to that was like, was it really hard to then leave the ringer and then obviously start the um, athletic? And I do believe you did some stuff with Peter King as well. Yeah. I, I worked with Peter in between Grantland and the ringer. So my contract was up at Grantland uh, about a month after we folded and Peter called me like three days later essentially asked if I wanted to come on there short term. And I said, definitely. <laughs> That's yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. It was the middle of the football season. So that was really nice. And then I, they offered me a job to stay at Sports Illustrated. And I had my, all my old buddies at the ringer offered me that job and I had to choose between them. And that was a torturous week. Um, but I went to go work for, with all the people at the ringer cause I knew them and I had, yeah. had such a good experience building grant one. I wanted to do it again. And even if you have an affinity for the people that you're working with and you know, those people are friends, I've developed very deep, you know, long standing relationships with all of them, but sometimes it's just time, you know, it's just time yeah. to try something new. It's time to go out on your own. I mean, I started working for Bill when I was 23, I'm 20, I'm 33 now. So it's just one of those things where sometimes you want to see what you can do and just try something new. And, and that's really what it was. Were you worried about joining the ringer again? Obviously like, Bill left ESPN and all that sort of stuff, which I have to go into. But were you worried? Were, did you, was there ever a doubt in your mind? Because obviously the ringer is huge now. And were you ever worried that he could that he wouldn't work again? Or no. were you confident he could do it? No. I was not, that was not, that never crossed my mind. Yeah. The the reason I wouldn't have wanted to go when I was kind of agonizing over that decision, it was I want to say it was March of 2016. I lost like 10 pounds that week. I was just pacing for like five straight days. The reason I didn't want to go is because I didn't want people to think I was just following Bill around. I wanted to see if I could do it on my own. And I, obviously I was working for Peter King. It's like a silly, like 26 year old <laughs> thing to say. I was not doing it on my own at all. But yeah, I just didn't want people to think that I was only following Bill around and that I wanted to see, can I do this under a different umbrella and be successful? And I realized that was kind of a misguided motivation. I, I just the chance to build something again with those people who we built something so special with the first time, I think eventually won out over that little contingent pride that I ended up realizing was misguided and not useful. Yeah, fair enough. And then I guess we'll, we'll move into more of the football stuff. And we know you're a, a long-time Chicago <laughs> Bears sufferer. And I, the recent news today is that Kyle Fuller has been cut and they've used – obviously, they needed the money to sign a quarterback like Andy Dalton to similar money. How are you feeling right now as a Chicago fan? I know this must be torture for you, but – You know, uh, it's been such a strange week because, yeah. you know, in a lot of ways, it felt like were they going to do everything they could – and here's the difficulty with this. There is no way for us from the outside to understand what the edicts are from ownership to the front office. There is no way to understand, all right, this is what we need from you this year. This is the money you can spend. These are the restrictions that you have. Because in my mind, when they brought Pace and Nagy back, I just assumed they would do everything they could to maximize the current window. And I thought that might lead to some really irresponsible decisions, trading first round picks for $25 million Carson Wentz, doing this, doing that, because there was an air of desperation there. But now... You know, they're cutting Kyle Fuller and potentially trading Akeem Hicks, which in a way I think is smarter than trying to go all in this year. I think tearing it down was the approach I would have done after last season had ended rather than all these half measures to try to get the most out of the current version of the roster. But if you're going to do that, 
Why bring the GM and the head coach back? If you're going to cut guys on the defense and you're trying to save money there, you're trying to sign Kenny Galladay. I just, (laughs) to me, the vision is very muddled, but I don't want to be too harsh on that just because I don't know what the lines of communication are like in the building and what they're trying to accomplish. I've really tried to step back as I've gotten older and not say that's stupid when some a team starts doing a lot of moves. More trying to say, I don't understand that and yeah. trying to work through that confusion, what might be going on, reading more into why teams are doing things rather than throwing out very quick value judgments about what they're doing. And even when it comes to the Bears where the emotions are so high, I still try to check myself and go through that same process as often as I can. Well, I've, I've had to go through a little – personal um going through that process i'm a patriot fan You're and everyone's patriot telling fan. me everyone's <laughs> telling me everyone's telling me that they're making uh-huh. a mistake here um the the worst. all those super bowls must be awful to yeah, it's, 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 tough. it's tough it's, it's been yeah. two years since you played the super bowl i'm sure it's been a long long road awful awful are you okay I, i'm not saying that i was just saying that i have to listen to everyone say how um the patriots made mistakes by spending the money that no one else really had other than, I guess, a few handful of teams. So is this the perfect, like, Bill Belichick zig, um, zig when everyone zags? Or is this, um, do you think you give Bel- Bill Belichick the benefit of the doubt in this situation? I think that they're just, I, I know we want to ascribe this magic to Bill Belichick, this kind of supernatural qualities to the way that he do he does things he does and there are well. aspects of and i and i do it too and there are aspects of that and what the patriots have been for the last 20 years they've been able to do so many things and gain edges and find inefficiencies and just build in really smart ways and conduct their business in really smart ways but i just think that this is an act out of necessity not some grand plan you know when you for the most part teams that spend in free agency have to spend in free agency because they haven't drafted well. They have to start building the core of their roster because they haven't built that core through the draft. The Patriots for a very long time didn't have to operate that way outside of like a couple of splash signings. You know, that's not as if they've been totally adverse to free agency in the past. You look at the Stephon Gilmore contract. There are a couple examples of that. You know, they traded for Brandon Cooks, for example. They've been in splashy veteran moves before. But it's, they've been isolated incidents. Now, because we're getting to the end of the road with some of those guys that they drafted, they've had to start building their roster through free agency. Look at the, the, look at the core of players that was around when they were winning those Super Bowls three or four years ago. Guys like Devin McCourty, Dante Hightower, Marcus Cannon, Joe Tooney's not on the roster anymore. That yeah. kind of last vestige of homegrown Patriots that – was the foundation of a championship roster. And they were able to supplement that with let's steal Kyle Van Noy. Let's do this. Let's do that. You can't do, you can't live in those marginal moves if the core of the roster isn't strong enough. And now that that group has kind of aged out or has gotten to the end and Brady is gone, I think that they're just left in a place where free agency no longer can be supplemental for them. They have to try to add talent because they're talent deficient. And teams run into this. You know, this happens. You know, the Packers were adverse to free agency forever. And eventually when they changed front offices, they made a splash because they said, we're not good enough. We haven't drafted well enough. The Seahawks are drafting terribly and they've had to get into the veteran trade market. And they're going to have to, they gave away two first round picks for Jamal Adams. They're going to have to extend Jamal Adams. They had to trade for Carlos Dunlap. They had to trade for Jemmy Clowney. When you aren't drafting well enough, you have to move into these necessary this necessary set of moves. I wouldn't call it desperation. I would just call it something that has to happen if you want to be competitive. And I just think that's where the Patriots are. I, I think you mentioned you know you mentioned the Seahawks there, the Patriots, and you talk about what they've got to do. That you've also got to take into 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 account they're drafting late every year. Mm-hmm. Right? The Hawks and the Patriots haven't drafted inside the top 20 for the past decade or longer for the Patriots. So, And we all know in the back of the first round, it becomes less and less and less as you go from kind of you know 15 to 32. The chances of those guys being successful are less and less and less. And you, know, you still get your good players, you know, like real good players, like your TJ Watts that you find late in the, in the first round. But 
majority of those guys, you're almost you're selecting second round talent in the first round. It's why a lot of those teams trade back. So you can't always just everyone go, "Oh, the Patriots draft terribly." Yes, yeah. In the first and second round, sometimes because they're they're drafting in the back. A lot of the time, they're just trying to find steals. Um, do they draft well later? Sometimes, but you know. I've kind of got this thing with the draft that I don't think any of the teams, you can analyze a guy to the cows come home. You can watch him, you can read him, you can watch his tape. You don't know how they're going to how they're going to be. And no. what I'm one is in free agency, you might have four, five, six, seven, eight years of NFL film on them. You know what you're getting. Now, do you overpay sometimes? Yes, you do because it's free agency. It's, it's, it's an open market. Everyone wants them. But it's not necessarily a bad thing if you do it well and you don't give monster deals i'd certainly prefer to sign you know like t- take khalil mack for a camp in, into account i would have preferred to sign him in free agency to a massive deal than give up two first round picks for him and then have to pay him anyway well that's the problem is those guys don't hit free agency and that's yeah. why i think if you look at the veteran trade market well i, I want to talk about the draft picks thing in a second because i think that's interesting but if you look yeah. at the veteran trade market i think it's it depends on how much you're trading right let's look at for example the Colts gave up one first round pick for DeForest Buckner and paid him a top of the market deal. They would do that a hundred times out of a hundred. I promise you that they would. The Seahawks gave up two first round picks for Jamal Adams. The Texans gave up two first round picks for Laramie Tunsil. When you're getting into that, it becomes a little more difficult. The ideal scenario is you give up a first round pick for certainty of a player that's not going to hit free agency, but is a star and you yeah. don't have to pay them. And that's what happened with Stefan Diggs. If you can trade for a veteran that's on a deal and you don't have to extend him on top of trading for him, that is ideal because you're getting the certainty and you're getting a class of player who's typically not available in free agency. That's why I think that the Cardinals just trading for Rodney Hudson right now. I think that stuff, that kind of stuff is smart. And the draft pick thing, I agree to a certain extent that it's much harder to find game changing players in the back half of the second round or the back half of the first round. But I also just think that teams hit dry spells. I mean, you look at what the Seahawks did from 2010 through 2012, 2013. It was an historic stretch of drafting. And they used that stretch to build a dynastic team. They only won one Super Bowl. But I think you could argue that they were the best team in the NFL for like a four to five year stretch. The Saints, with one draft, managed to fix five years of mismanagement because they found three high quality starters in one draft in 2017. If you start hitting some dry spells over and over again with those drafts, it's just really hard to fix it in any other way. And I think in a in large part, those dry spells are inevitable. There are a few teams that are a little bit better than draft at drafting than other teams are. I think if you look at the history of it, like the Ravens have drafted marginally better than other teams. The Packers have drafted marginally better than other teams. But for the most part, everyone exists kind of in the middle ground. I think it's just about understanding that you don't know more than other teams, consistently trading back to add picks, and knowing that your conviction on players is probably going to end up proven wrong in the end, and that's where you get into a bad spot. Trading up, trying to you know, trading future first round picks, future second round picks, all of that. If we can see that every team is about the same at drafting, it's more about giving yourself additional bites at the apple than it is anything else. I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I 100% agree with what you're saying. It's, it, yeah. And then you talk about like teams that if you hit, it only takes a couple of hits. Like I, I said, I'm a, I'm a Cowboys fan and we were dreadful. And then all of a sudden, they hit on three offensive linemen three years in a row. You yep. get Tyron Smith, Zach Martin, and Travis Frederick. And then you get, you know, Lyle Collins had that non issue that ended up making him fall to an undrafted free agent. You hit him, and all of a sudden, you've got four guys that, just dominate line of scrimmage. And then that bought you that year in 2016 where Ezekiel Elliott was, you know, the, the rushing leader, Prescott won rookie of the year. And everyone thinks, wow, this is the biggest thing. But you, you then have to, what the Cowboys did wrong, and I don't think they signed any good free agents from there. Every free agent they bought in, oh, maybe a couple, but overall, they look at the Bucks this year. They made great draft picks and then bought in free agents that have been high impact. Shaq Barrett, Tom Brady, and it leads to a Super Bowl. You have to have both, in my opinion. You can't just draft well and go, okay, we're good now. We're drafted well because you've got to hit those back end, you know, those back end contracts, those smaller two year deals with players that are going to be good starters. I think just signing a guy, a drafting guy, and going, oh, he's going to be a superstar, it's it's blind. I don't think that ever works that way. So I think what my point is you, you need to hit both. You can't just draft 
and then, oh, your draft is the only thing that matters and you're going to be good. You've got to also have free agents, free agents that come in and are productive for you. I think that's true. I think ideally that's you'd build with a blend, right? But there are teams that the financial realities of what they have to deal with don't allow them to do that. It's easy for the Rams to operate like they do when they can spend 120% cash over the cap every single year and they're just mm. kicking the can down the road. There are teams like Indianapolis, for example, they can't spend more than the salary cap every single year. So they can't go out and say, we're adding four dummy years to whoever's deal and giving him all this cash up front. Even the Bucks now, the only reason they're retaining this roster is that they're taking financial chances and risks that they don't typically make. So some teams aren't on the same playing field. It's really complicated, but I think in an ideal world, yes, that's what you would do. And the Bucks are a perfect example. They drafted extremely well. They got lucky to find two high quality starters in the first two rounds this year that put them over the top. And they don't have an all pro right tackle that they found with like the 13th overall pick. Who knows if they win the Super Bowl? Fourth tackle drafted. Yes. And Fourth. it's stuff like that. It's just, it, it is, there's so much luck involved with this sometimes. But I agree with you. I think that what I would do if I were a general manager is I would draft. I, I would try to build through the draft as much as possible. I would accumulate picks at every single possible turn. Every time I didn't love a guy, I would trade back. Every single time. I would just try to do it as often as I could. I would play the comp pick formula as often as I could in the way that the Ravens do. And I would try to build that way. And then I would say, how do I supplement my roster through free agency? How do I find guys in the 5 to $10 million range on one to two-year deals that can come in and fill immediate needs for me and refresh my roster as often as possible every one to two years. I think the team that has done that the best in the way that they've weaponized free agency over the last couple of seasons is the Bills. You, know, you look at all the different guys they've cycled out, and I think that it's a really smart way to think about defense, in my opinion, because defense is so volatile from season to season statistically. And if you're just saying, we're going to bring the same players back over and over again, run the same defensive scheme, and just hope that we have linear progression from our young players and everything else, you're always going to be disappointed. But the Bills have looked at some of those rotational positions and said, all right, Mario Addison, Quentin Jefferson, Vernon Butler, this is the new group of defensive linemen we're bringing in for one year. We'll see what sort of jump they can give us. Now – how do we do this again? They'll probably look, now Quentin Jefferson's gone. Can we replace him with another interior lineman? Do we need another edge? That kind of stuff, I think, is a really smart way of thinking about it. And again, it's a supplemental way of thinking, not the way to build the core of your roster. And I would just like to jump in. You talked about the money issues uh, real quick. We get you out of here. Um, the Raiders have been, there's been whispers that, you know, they don't technically have that cash. Um, there was, Talk of that when they moved Khalil Mack, and now obviously they're just kind of discarding their offensive line. That was a strength of their team. Is that? Do you think that's the case, or is there something else going on there? I don't want to speculate on that. I, I haven't done enough reading or research about it to know. It just seems like that's so difficult for an NFL yeah. team to have cash flow issues. No, <laughs> like, no. Even in a year like this, I just can't believe that – is real. I, 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 again, it might be, and I don't want to speak one way or the other, but you know, and, and now after the TV deals were signed, I don't want an NFL yeah. team to cry cash poor for the rest of the time. I don't care if you don't have a single other avenue for making money and for lining your own pockets other than owning an NFL team, which there are several of those. I root for one of those where the team is all they have. It doesn't matter. I, I'm assuming there is enough cash on hand for you to give Rodney Hudson $9 million in base salary. Like that's just, I feel like that is a built in excuse for a team that just doesn't want to pay guys. I don't know that that seems weird to me and, and hard to believe. Especially when you can pay Kenyon Drake almost six. Yeah. I don't understand that. I, I, I just, <laughs> I it, get it like this idea that they were cutting their expensive offensive linemen to restock their defense and then they paid Kenyon Drake when they spent a first round pick on a running back two years ago. I, this is something that I've really come to appreciate and understand as I've gotten older. When I was young, 
I would look at NFL general managers and coaches and people like that and think they are, they're smart people. They know what they're doing. And I, I, I think that's for the most part, they are smart people. But then you sit down and you have some conversations with some of these guys. And then you realize at the end, this is not rocket science. Like they don't have some grand master plan. If you walk into some of these places and you ask, how are you building this? I don't think anyone, every single one of those teams could articulate to you like a 10 step plan for how this is going to go. Like don't, don't hesitate to ascribe incompetence to some of this. Again, I'm not saying people are stupid. I'm just saying that there are mistakes made here that can be avoided. This is not some grand scheme that has just gone awry because for whatever reason. And I, I just think that's important for me to understand. And I've come to really appreciate that as I've gotten older. You can't put people on a pedestal just because of where they are. That's exactly right. And that's exactly right. I mean, it. there are times where you'll just, I'll, and maybe they're saying that to me because, they don't want to give me proprietary information or whatever, but there have been times where I've been sitting at a table with an NFL general manager having a conversation and they'll say something and I'll just be like, that's just not true. <laughs> that's just ostensibly incorrect. And that fuels some of the decision-making that happens. You see it all the time. And I just think that's really important to understand. Some of these teams do not have as well thought out a plan as we like to think they do. Yeah, absolutely. And I get, look, we're really conscious of your time, Robert. I got one more question for you. Sure. One more little topic. I so I, I I play in the Australian leagues over here. Calling it playing is very <laughs> it, it's, it's a loose term, but it is, it is a league. I'm, I'm a long time offensive lineman. I have been so excited to talk to you because when I listen to your podcasts, all the guys constantly give me crap. Going, imagine you and Robert Mays in a room talking offensive line. <laughs> <laughs> I live for it, and I to the, for the life of me cannot understand what the Raiders are doing with offensive line. Why your biggest strength for two years when you've got this first round running back, you know, you want to bring in guys like Kenyon Drake. Why would you trade away three of your best guys and then bring back Incognito, who's probably, he's been productive, he's been okay, but he's not your best. Uh, is, can you, do you understand that? To, to, to your, like, Do you get it? I, I think I sort of do. I yeah. feel like some of the moves that they've made because the NFL is about opportunity, free agency and finances and everything else is about opportunity cost, right? So if you're paying one guy X amount of dollars, that precludes you theoretically from paying another guy that amount of money. So if you're looking at what they got from Trent Brown over the last couple of years, I can un totally understand coming to the conclusion eventually of we, we are not getting a return on how much we're paying this guy. We feel like if we took that money and spread it out and had a replacement come in for him, we can get similar enough production and save money and use it elsewhere. And I think yeah. along the interior, I can understand that with Denzel Good and Gabe Jackson. If you want to say we're paying Denzel Good significantly less than we pay Gabe Jackson, he's been hurt and ineffective intermittently anyway. We saw what Denzel Good can do for the, for the less price. We feel like we're getting more value there. Incognito has been fine. So if you look at it from left to right, you're not losing that much and not changing that much from what that group looked like last year when you consider the injuries and how much time guys missed. The Hudson thing to me makes no sense. That's, that that's is the only sense. one that I, there's maybe something's going on there because that's the one where even if you like, I think Andre James is his name. I forget it five times a day as I try to talk about it. it is. The guy that was their backup that they wanted to elevate to play that spot. Even if you think he can be okay. I still think having a, a center with Rodney's awareness and how smart he is and the protections that he helps with and everything else, I think he makes all the guys around him better in pass protection. I think Derek is also very smart, and that is helpful when it comes to setting protections, getting rid of the ball, everything else. Maybe in their minds, he handles so much that Rodney does less for them than he does for another team. I'm just trying to figure it out. But for the most part, I can understand some of the things that they're doing. I just don't know. To me, it's more about what are you doing with that money that you're freeing up? If you want to save money, fine. And if you think you can get 80% of what you got from those other guys with cheaper options, more power to you. But to me, it's how are you using the money that you're saving? And I don't think they're doing it very well. I love offensive linemen. I, I think that having a really good one is an undeniable advantage. I also think that you have to be smart in the ways you invest in one. 
Like the Chiefs giving Joe Tooney $16 million and the Chargers giving Matt Filer seven or Kevin, the Ravens giving Matt Zeitler seven or Kevin Zeitler seven. Yeah. I think you have to ask some questions there. And I think the Raiders are probably thinking something similar. It's like, do we want to pay top of market or do we think we can get 80% for middle of the market? That to me is worth interrogating and worth exploring. But again, it's how are you using that money that you're saving if you're going to be skimping on the offensive line a little bit. And I guess it's the same with, you know, the Chiefs, obviously Kyle Long, who was who was a good player at Chicago before injuries, you know, kind of derailed him. He retired. It to me, that's a great signing. Now you might get nothing out of Kyle Long. He might be be broken down and, and not be able to perform and he might end up just getting cut. But if if they get productivity out of him like, you know, 80, 75% of what his best was in Chicago, that's an that's an outstanding deal they've signed. That's absolutely right. And I mean, he, I think his base salary is a million and a half dollars. Yeah. So, I mean, the, those are the, the flyers we're taking. And it's funny because those two signings, bringing in Joe Tooney, and apparently they were in the market for Trent Williams, those type of guys in Kyle Long are at the exact opposite ends of the yeah. free agent spectrum. And I don't yeah. think that it, it's incongruous to be signing both of those types of deals. I just think it's interesting that the same team signed both of them. I feel like you should be taking those sorts of flyers when you've already spent $16 million on Joe Tooney, because if we're averaging it out, right, that's two, $8 million players. And I think that is how I would approach it. So uh, Brett Veach knows what he's doing. I think that there are some moves they've made that are burning them now. Like I think that if you look at their salary cap and you see $26 million for a Frank Clark, that was like 35th in the NFL in pressures last year. And you have to cut both of your offensive tackles. That's not great. But I still think that they have an understanding of what they want to be accomplishing there. Does Jeff Schwartz go back? Do you think if he's healthy? I, if, yeah, sorry, Mitchell Schwartz. Sorry, I got. Sorry, Jeff I was like, I don't know if Jeff's going to play anymore. <laughs> so I, um, <laughs> I really don't know. I, I I think that the the right opportunity would have to present itself to him. I think that you know, I've said this before, and I, I feel comfortable saying it. He was never somebody that was going to hold on. He's he has a lot of varied interests. Um, he's not somebody that I don't think needs football every single day in order to feel fulfilled or anything like that. He is somebody that was never going to play to age 38. That was never going to happen. So if there is a really great chance and he, his body feels great, maybe later in the summer, I think that's possible, but I wouldn't expect anything anytime soon. Yeah. It's, it's, it's hard. Cause you know, you sit here and analyze it. You don't know. You're exactly right. Maybe Mitchell Schwartz doesn't want to play football anymore. Maybe he's had a great run. He's been one of the best right tackles for the past 10 years. And maybe he's ready to go, I've made my money. I can go and not play football. You, you never know what the – or we don't over here. You probably get more insider in than we do. But we sit here and we go, oh, why wouldn't he just re-sign with someone? Maybe he doesn't want to. We don't know what the personal lives are. Maybe he wants to spend time with his family. You know? It's – um, yeah, it's – it's it, it's very interesting. I think sometimes to know the you know the nuances of what's going on in their lives can affect football a lot because they're people. absolutely. And for him, I, I know him enough to to have some insight there. The other players, for the most part, I don't. But that's it's a hundred percent true. You know, that there's just no way we can understand that type of stuff and how it affects their decision making. All right, Robert. Thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. you coming on all the way over from the good old USA. Um, yeah, we really appreciate you and hopefully you come back another time. Sounds good. Thanks. Sorry, the sun is like halfway on my face today. Yeah. It's a weird right. time of day. I'm not used to recording at 10 a.m. I, I, I think we'll have to plan an offensive line podcast, just me and you, Robert. I could talk about it. For <laughs> I'm always down to talk about it. Maybe like I, nine hours free for us to talk. <laughs> <laughs> I'll no, really, out of my schedule for sure. Awesome. We really appreciate it, Robert. Thanks so much. No it's worries, guys. Good to talk to you. Thanks a lot, mate. Thanks. Bye. See ya. Uh, thanks, Robert, mate. He's that's just so. Cool. He's awesome. Yeah. I know. Great. We it it was my. We were going to spend some more time with him, everyone, but um, I won't go into the whys. But <laughs> I was about well, half an hour late, so we did have to rush through a bit. He gave us so much, though. Like, and it's just it's it's weird hearing his voice when you listen to someone so often, then hearing their voice on a show. Um, well, then you're seeing him as well. It's like it's my yeah. personal. Yeah, you've never seen. I've never seen his voice out of his mouth, but I've heard it so many times. It was the same when you know you've had guys from like around the NFL on. You hear the voice. You're like, I listen to you almost every day. Yet, you know, I've never seen the words out of your mouth. It's it's a really cool experience. So, 
thanks a bunch to Robert Mays. If you don't, if you don't listen to, to the Athletic podcast, um, I don't know what you're doing. Robert Mays is one of the most insightful, you know, NFL podcasters, analysts, wh- whatever you want to call him. Um, do yourself a favor and, and tune into him. I'll, I'll put some of his links in the description. Hey guys, I just wanted to uh, thank again Robert Mays and Corey for getting that interview done. I did, me and Corey ended up doing a bit of a podcast after, but a lot of the stuff we talked about um, wasn't entirely relevant for, well, it was relevant at the time, Saturday night when we recorded, but um, from then they've uh, all been signed. So the guys, a lot of the stuff we talked about became irrelevant, but um, so I did cut Corey out, which no one should complain about because we all know that. I was the star of the show, Robert May second, Richie third, and Corey last. So we all know how it went. Um, he's only a fantasy podcaster, so you know it's a bit of a different world for him. But it was good to you know bring Corey along to to our level and and let him you know it's kind of like bringing someone up from the minor leagues to the major leagues just to have a real have a real go at it. And he's got the stuff to go back and work on it. And maybe one day he can uh, he can establish himself as a as a as a full time NFL podcaster, but we'll see. Fantasy football is probably his gig for now. Um, no, all seriousness, Corey, thank you so much. He he did get that interview with Robert, and it was outstanding. It was a great chat. Um, thanks everyone for tuning in. Thank you to our sponsors, Patreon. Um, make sure if you want to get your chance to win this bad boy this month, sign up. Also, apologies to the YouTube people if you're watching on YouTube. The video stuffed up. You missed about the first minute of Robert May's interview. The full versions on the podcast, but the sound stuffed up with the recording and then and then kicked in after about 30 seconds. So apologies to people watching on YouTube. You did miss a bit of the start of Robert Mays. But um, again, thank you to everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks to our beautiful sponsors, Burnley Brewing. Love your work and uh, you'll hear from us next week. Thanks, guys.